will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Now look at section one. Section one. You will hear a woman telephoning the police to report a theft. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning, Wessex Police Department. Hi, um, I need to report a theft. You've had something stolen? Yes, I have. Have I got the right number? Yes, let me just get a form for theft. Right, this is it. Let me take a few personal details first. Can you tell me your first name? Yes, of course. It's Sabrina. And what's your surname, please? MacArthur. M-C-A... No, it's M-A-C-A-R-T. H U R. Oh, right. And can I have a contact phone number? Yes, it's O seven one double eight two double three seven six four. Okay, got that. Now, what is it that's been stolen? Well, I think the thief thought it was my purse. But in fact, it was my reading glasses. They were in a soft case on the top of my rucksack. I didn't realise they were missing until I got to college and started doing some coursework. I see. That must be inconvenient. Can you tell me how much they were worth? Well, I had them specially made about nine months ago, and I paid £215 for them. And are there any special features that would make them easy to identify? No, not really. They're quite expensive, but they look quite ordinary. My previous ones were a bit special. They were silver and had a blue flash. But these were just brown, quite plain, really. OK, I'll make a note of that. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 5 to 10. Right, let me take some details of the theft. Can you tell me when it happened? Well, it was this morning. OK, so that's today's date, which is the 13th... No, just a minute, that's yesterday. Uh, the 14th of February. And what time? It must have been around 8.30am. And where did it happen? Well, I only discovered them missing when I got to college. But I do remember someone bumping into my rucksack when I was at the station. I was waiting for a train and the platform was very crowded. It was the rush hour, you see. 
and there were a lot of people standing behind me and I was aware of my rucksack being touched. So it must have been then. OK. Did you see the person who was touching your rucksack? No, I'm afraid I didn't. The train was late and I was starting to worry about missing my first lecture. I see. So, were there any witnesses? Do you think anyone saw the thief? Yes, my brother was standing behind me and he noticed someone near my rucksack. He didn't realise at the time that anything had been taken, so he didn't mention it to me. But when I realised something had been stolen, I told him about it and he remembered seeing this person. I see. And so were you able to get a description of the person? Well, apparently the guy was quite tall. OK, good. Anything else? Any idea of age or build? What about hair? Was it long or short? Don't know about the length, but I was told it was black. I think that's about all I know, I'm afraid. That's OK. There have been a number of reported thefts recently in that particular area, so we're trying to get a picture of whether a number of thieves are involved, or if it's just one or two. So any details, no matter how small, will help us. Has this kind of thing happened to you there before? No, it hasn't, but a friend of mine had something stolen a couple of weeks ago. And what happened then? Well, someone bumped into him. He didn't realise why at the time, but later he discovered that his wallet had been stolen. OK. And did he report it? Oh, yes. Good. Right. So, just one last question. Are you insured? Well, I wasn't going to bother with insurance, but we were given a talk about the importance of it when we started college. So fortunately, I arranged some quite recently. Well, that was lucky. What kind of policy do you have? Are you sure it'll cover your theft? Yes, it should do. It's called student property and it covers theft at home, when I'm travelling and also at college. OK, that should be fine then. So we'll get in touch if we have any news. Right, thanks. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 1 is now complete. Now look at Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a talk by a college principal welcoming students to Fairlight College. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Goddard, and I'm the principal of Fairlight College. First of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you at the start of your studies here at Fairlight. We are a medium-sized college, with approximately 2,500 students, 60% of which are full-time. We also have a teaching staff of highly trained professionals, totalling 127. The college buildings 
are about 50 years old, and they were not initially used as a college. You may be surprised to hear that this site was originally a holiday village for about 40 years, and when that closed down, the buildings were adapted to create the state-of-the-art college that we have today. Of course, we do hope you have fun here, but we also expect hard work from you all. Most organizations, and indeed many colleges, have mission statements which set out their key objective. These are sometimes quite lengthy and complicated, but we believe in keeping things simple here. Ours is aim high, and I'd like you all to keep that in mind throughout your studies. Our main purpose, of course, is to provide you with an education, but we also take seriously the need to prepare you for life, and in particular, for whatever you plan to do when you've finished your studies. Over the past 10 years, the College has worked hard to establish links with local industry in order to provide you with opportunities for work experience, both during your studies and afterwards. I strongly recommend that you take advantage of these opportunities. And finally, you may have already heard about the Freshers Ball for first-year students, but I'd just like to remind you that this is an ideal opportunity to relax and get to know each other. The date is October the 5th. In the past, we've held the ball on the college campus, but this year we decided to hold it in town at the Sunset Club. It's near the centre of town and is about three miles from the college. So, make sure you put that in your diaries. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. I'd now like to point out a few important college facilities. I hope you all managed to pick up a map of the college campus on your way in. I'm not going to go over everything on the map, but I'd like to point out a few things that you should be aware of. So, first of all, I imagine most of you will have noticed the car park and the registration and admin building when you arrived today, and which are at the bottom of your map. It's easy to find the sports centre as it's located conveniently by the playing fields at the bottom right on the map. The layout of the campus is very straightforward, and there's basically a path that leads up through the centre with facilities on either side. I'm sure you're all keen to get hold of your course books and I guess one of the most important places is the library. This is situated on the left of the main path, just after the cafe. I'd now like to draw your attention to a new addition to the campus and one which we're all very excited about. This is the Innovation Centre, and is where we're hoping that all your creative ideas will produce some great new inventions. To get there, if you follow the central path past the orchard and then the arts building on your left, you cross the river and it's the new building on the right. The building on the left is the medical centre, 
And if any of you have any medical conditions that we should be aware of, please call in here and register with the nurse. OK, so I'd just like to point out the other two faculty buildings. To the right of the orchard and on the other side of the main path is the science block and the river runs behind this building. And next to this and further along the river is the humanities building. So, I think we've covered all the faculty buildings. Now, finally, you will notice the four buildings in the square in front of registration and admin. The two on the left I mentioned previously, and on the other side of the path, the one nearest registration and admin, is the college shop, and the other is the canteen, which is open from 7.30 in the morning until 8 p.m. in the evening. Well, I hope that helps to orientate you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me or any of the other members of staff. And I'm sure in no time at all, this will all become very familiar. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2 is now complete. Now look at Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student called Metin talking to his tutor about an engineering assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, Medin. How are you? Fine, thanks. I wondered if I could just have a word with you about my engineering assignment. Yes, I've got a class in half an hour, but I can give you about 10 minutes. I do need the other 20 minutes to get myself sorted out before I teach, though. That's fine. I just wanted to discuss some ideas with you. OK. So, what aspect of building are you doing your assignment on? Well, I decided in the end to choose bridge construction. I had several ideas at the start, but I didn't want to focus on anything too modern. I wanted to opt for something that's been around for a long time. Yes, I guess people have always built bridges. Whereas skyscrapers, for example, are great, but they're relatively recent constructions. OK, well, that's a good reason. What aspect of bridge construction are you going to cover? Well, there are some amazing bridges in different places and countries, so I thought I would start with some pictures just a page or so of bridges around the world, and then go on to write about them. Hmm. That would involve quite a range of designs. It might be better to narrow your theme down a bit. It might make it easier for you to structure your work. Yes, I'm not very good at making choices. You know, like a lot of students, you're trying to cover too much. Right, I see. Plus, you need to think about what you're being assessed on. Did I give you the outline for this? Yes, but um, I don't think I have it here. Well, last year's students will tell you that you won't do well if you only present an overview of something. 
It's not enough, no matter how many words you write. I see. You mean we have to show that we can go into something in detail? Exactly. Perhaps it would be a good idea to have a rethink when you get home. Do you have plenty of books and articles? Yes, I've got them at my flat. My flatmate said I didn't need to bring them. Well, it would have been helpful if you'd brought them along. Anyway, review all the literature you have first, and that will help you develop your ideas. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. So, which bridges have you read about already? OK, well, I've read an article on suspension bridges, you know, like the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Uh-huh. What do you find particularly interesting about this type of bridge? Well, I think a lot of people believe that they're a very modern steel-based structure, but actually there were some very old ones that were made using grass that was twisted to form a rope. They were often used to walk between mountains, weren't they? Very scary. Yes. Um, Arch-shaped bridges also go back a long time. Um, they're quite interesting, too. Well, they go back to Roman times, don't they? Yes. And what I hadn't realised is that these ancient arch bridges were made without using cement to hold the stone together. So the builders needed some form of scaffolding to build the top part of the arch. But that's still true today, isn't it? Despite all the modern materials we have, workmen still can't bring the two sides of an arch bridge together without having a framework around the arch while it's being built. No, so this basic principle hasn't changed much, even though they may look different today. Hmm. What other bridges are there you could focus on? There are beam bridges. They're about the simplest in terms of construction. Just a horizontal surface made of wood, stone, steel or concrete and two supports. Yes. Uh, parts of these bridges are often known as girders and people sometimes refer to them as girder bridges. Right. They're often most commonly used for trains and cars, aren't they? Uh-huh. And uh, what about complex designs? Well, um... A bridge called the Cable Stayed Bridge is just amazing to look at. It's a bit like a suspension bridge, but it only has one end or tower, and obviously a lot of cables going from this to the surrounding area. Now, this is a modern bridge, isn't it? It is, although interestingly, I noted that there are sketches of it that date back to the 16th century. And yet the first cable-stayed bridges were built in the 1940s, I believe. That's right. Well, you obviously have a lot of knowledge already. Yes, and I guess I could select an ancient bridge design and a modern one. Now that would be a good idea. OK. So, I don't think you need to see me again. I think you can select your material yourself this week. I would quite like to write it out and let you see it before I submit my final draft. OK. You can email it to me. And remember to plan your assignment before you write it. I will. Thanks. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 3 is now complete. Now look at Section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about the behaviour of birds, called starlings. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone and welcome to this talk on the natural world. I'd like to start off by introducing our guest speaker, John Thompson, who will be speaking to us about the behaviour and characteristics of birds called starlings, which are really quite astonishing. Over to you, John. Yes, thank you. Right, so starlings are a very common type of bird. They're medium-sized and their feathers, although multicoloured, appear dark and metallic looking. They're found mainly in Europe, Africa and Asia, but they do exist in most parts of the world. What I want to focus on today is a particular aspect of starling behaviour called murmurations. Now, starling murmurations take place when large numbers of the birds gather together and form something that resembles a huge black cloud that swoops and swirls and spins in the sky. I'm going to describe when this happens and suggest why and how the birds do it. So, when does it happen? Well, it starts during autumn. Groups of starlings begin to gather in favoured places and these develop into murmurations that can comprise a few hundred birds up to over a million. The groups increase in size as more starlings arrive and reach their maximum populations in midwinter, when migrating birds from colder climates join the main groups. Why do they do this? Well, no one is really sure, and there are several theories. But a possible reason is for protection, based on the principle of safety in numbers. However, another theory is that it is to pass on information. As the starlings gather, their daily routine is fairly constant. Early in the day, groups of starlings go out to find feeding places. They can travel up to 40 kilometres each day. But the interesting thing here is that they always return at the same time each day. The murmurations can best be seen at dusk, when the numbers are the largest, and it may be that information on what they have discovered throughout the day is passed around in the evening. So, as I said, these murmurations are astonishing to look at. The acrobatics and the displays are remarkable, but how do they do it? Again, no one is really sure, but in the last few years, a lot more progress has been made. In 2008, a team of Italian researchers conducted groundbreaking studies on the starlings of Rome. These scientists used a series of interlinked cameras to measure how individual shapes of starling groups change over time. They discovered that the birds changed positions in the group and took turns to be in front, at the sides, in the middle, and at the back, and that there were three basic rules. Move in the same direction as your neighbour, stay close to your neighbour, and, as starlings can reach speeds of over 70 kilometres per hour, the third rule is the most critical, and that is to avoid a collision. 
And interestingly, the distance between neighbouring birds is much less than the distance of each bird from the one in front and the one behind. This is probably because starlings can see better to the side than straight ahead, and having a larger gap in front and behind is rather like safe motorway driving, where cars need to keep their distance from the drivers in front. But even though the birds try to follow their neighbours as closely as possible, a tiny deviation by one bird is magnified by the surrounding birds. It is this that creates the impression of a huge cloud. So, to end this bit, just a few notes on starling populations. Since the 1970s, in the UK there has been a reduction of 70% in starling populations. In fact, the numbers of starling in the UK are a fraction of what they used to be, and they are now on the critical list. For example, at Brighton Pier on the south coast of England, murmuration sizes are now around 50,000, whereas they used to be up to half a million. However, we believe that numbers in the 18th century were also quite low, because there is little reference to starlings in literature from 200 years ago. Well, compared to other birds that were around at that time. It's thought that numbers grew rapidly throughout the Industrial Revolution, partly because the weather was milder. And starlings are able to settle in new places quite easily. In 1890, an American decided to introduce all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare's plays to America. He released 60 starlings in Central Park, New York, and the birds thrived. There are estimated to be over 2 million starlings in the USA now, and they can be found as far as the West Coast. Now, to move on to their habitat... That is the end of Section 4.